Hello, everyone, and welcome to So Very Wrong About Games. I'm your co-host, Mark Bigney, and with me, as always, is my loyal co-host, Mike Walker. How are you doing, Walker? Always good, Mark. So you caused a little bit of a stir on Spike social media, posting pictures of your half-empty Kallax. Yes. Normally, <laughs> collection porn is of the nature of, see, look at all the things that I've acquired with a possible corollary of the shelf of shame. But you've engaged in a rather significant culling over the past few weeks. It's true. My life took a different turn and... and I had to make changes, and if, if you or somebody else I knew already had a game, it was out of the collection, or if it was games that were just uh, sitting around, I really think games need to be played. So if they're not getting played, I think they should go somewhere where they will get played. As somebody who benefited from a copy of Food Chain Magnate, I'm not really in a position to complain, but this is uh, an impressive act of discipline. Now I just have to get rid of Like, saying that I culled 50% of my collection, or... See, I, I specifically used key words in what I said. They are out of my active collection. Yes. Which now I means I have more boxes filled with games. Now I just got to get rid of those. And this, it will be, it will happen. I need it to happen. And that's and even, it, and it will happen. That's even leaving aside your excellent strategy. See, even when I met you several years ago, it was already the case that you had a whole bunch of stuff like, you know, 40K armies and all manner of things hidden in various basements scattered around Ontario. And now I know how that happened because in the process of you moving, you would take large stacks of games and say, has uh, is, is this got any trade value? And I'd say, I don't think so. And say, okay, well, you take it anyway. And so now my basement gets to have a whole bunch of Walker cast off. And you seem to have the sort of gold fish attitude or an infant newborn with no object permanence. If it's outside your immediate sight lines, it's not a problem anymore. Well, I, I just learned my lessons from certain kings. He stashed dragon fire all over the city. I just stash games all in this. So like whenever I, you know, I need my gaming fix, I don't have to, you know, crawl far and I'll get, you know, my gaming fix on. I see. So based on whatever your mood happens to be at the given day, this is either free storage or it's the case that it's not yours anymore. So it's not your problem. Exactly. That's awfully convenient for you. Anyway, so we're in our summer schedule here at Sorry Wrong About Games. And what that means is we're going to talk about the games we played last week. We're going to talk about the news and why it doesn't matter. And we're going to talk about our feature game this week, which is Gentis, the uh, the deluxe version. And that's what I'm going to be calling it because I refuse to use the stupid word. You can, Walker might use the stupid word. That's his prerogative. And next week, just as a reminder about how we're going to be doing things, next week we're going to have our Euros games we played last week, news and why it doesn't matter, and a topic. So that's how we'll be alternating things. And so far, it's working out pretty well, and uh, Air Canada has not received too many complaints, so we're just going to see how well this experiment can continue. So on that topic, let's talk about the games we played last week. I played Bios Megafauna 2nd Edition. Sorry, what, what was the name of that game again? Bios Megafauna 2nd Edition. Okay, that's that's a great game to look up on Board Game Geek, I'm sure. I love how the, these places call their names these bizarre names that make it impossible for anyone to find. It's quite so the opposite. they go to obscurity. No, it's quite the opposite. As opposed to something like called The Game, you cannot find that on Board Game Geek. But Megafauna, you're only going to get a couple results. One of them is going to be the first edition of Bios Megafauna, and another one is going to be... If you know well, it's going to be American it. Megafauna. Yeah. Any, anyhow... Well, if you don't know how to spell Megafauna, look it up. <laughs> so, Bias Megafauna 2nd Edition, this is another Phil Eklund game at Sierra Madre. He co-designed it with a couple of other people who have not shown up again in the uh, you know, Sierra, Sierra Madre core clan, which happens to be people whose last name is Eklund. And I was, you know, hopeful that this was an indication of Eklund designing slightly more substantial games, a little bit less random, a little bit less crazy. Because American Megafauna, the sort of first edition, is was a wild, overlong, crazy roller coaster of a thing where people didn't really have much control and it took took forever. I will say that Bios Megafauna only lasted about ninety minutes after the rather cumbersome rules explanation, but all the interesting stuff to me was the events. The way Bios Megafauna works is you pull an event and a variety of crazy things happen to the clan of the planet. A crater emerges somewhere in the middle of Siberia. A continental drift occurs and you form Pangea. A whole bunch of planktons bloom somewhere and that creates a new ocean in, in, in the middle of nowhere. Kind of cool stuff. And you have no control over it. So watching that happen was kind of neat. And then each player gets to do some number of actions. And that was part of the problem already. One of the factions uh, operates on an entirely different action track and they start out in relative control over the random events. They have some degree of, of prerogative about how it plays out. And the random events influence how many actions people get. So long story short, in our game, the plants who start off in, in this role had twice as many actions as any of the other factions. Literally, they had four actions a turn and we had two actions a turn. 
And it's very hard to compete against twice as much action efficiency to say nothing of the fact that they had a greater organ capability. The theming is great. Look, you, you play as plants competing against mollusks, competing, competing against insects, competing against uh, you know standard uh, mammalian endoskeletal vertebrates, things like that. And uh, a lot of the things that happen are cool to watch, but none of the things that you do are particularly satisfying, especially in the context of all the interesting stuff being out of your control and a lot of other wild things happening. Anyhow, I'm not going to be playing it again. It was an interesting sort of experience game. I'm glad I got to see some of these ideas play out, but that coupled with the rather aggressive... Uh, climate denialism that's kind of baked into the design, no pun intended, and the vague sort of conspiracy mongering that infects the rule book about how only Phil Eklund really understands how the climate works. And all these other climate scientists are all on the take uh, and all being politically motivated by secret, shadowy international organizations. And, I, and I'm hardly exaggerating, to be honest. It's not worth it. I'm willing to put up with that kind of nonsense for PAX Renaissance because it's it's a very satisfying game. And all the wildness is more or less under your control. But in Bios Megafauna, the wildness happens through the system. And so cool things happen, but you're not doing them. So I, I think uh, PAX Renaissance for me is kind of an anomaly in the universe of Phil Eklund games. And I'm happy to keep playing that. But I don't think I'm going to be seeking out a lot of his other stuff. And that was my take on Bios Megafauna 2nd Edition. Mark got to introduce me to Brook City. It's the next game from the Street Masters people. And it's very much like he said. They seem to have taken the parts that we enjoy from Street Fighters and pulled them out. And everything that was tedious left them in. So in, in Street Masters, movement is interesting and fun. You don't, you're not really ever, you know, hindered that much. You know, you want to flip over here and punch something out, which is the fun part. You can do it. But in Brook City, the movement seems to be the majority of the game. Trying to maximize how you can get where you need to go, gaming it out, making it, you know, like silly, jumping in like out of, you know, four different cars. That's exaggeration. But doing stuff like that just to get where you need to go so you can do a semi-tedious thing. All in all, I still think it played out fairly well because the bad guy turns seem to be, even though we played, I was told, a more basic version of the bad guy, it still seemed to flow a little easier than it did in, in Street Masters because in Street Masters, you're moving every figure and then you're going through this whole card cycle where this, the enemies never move. You're just doing what the card says and then you're moving on. So there's not all this, you know, you know, moving the bad guys all the time. So other than that, I think Street Masters is definitely the better of the two games, but I'd want to play Brook City again just to see, you know, how it plays out with one of the more difficult bosses. I'm in roughly the same position. I, I think that most of the things that were emphasized in Brook City are the less cool bits of the system to go to show for it. Part of that is just a, a, a preference issue. Like, Brook City is more about moving around the map. Whereas Street Masters, you know, the movement matters, your position matters, but it's much less of a focus. And to be honest, I actually find the jumping in and out of cars to be the most fun part of Brook City. You know, the part where you take your police cruiser, your Royal Vic, and you drive it into the side of a cafe because you're driving too fast, and you show up out of nowhere, and then you go and you arrest some suspect, and then you merge into the street, and then corral some passing civilian who's driving in a Mercedes, yank them out and say, don't worry, build, build the Brook City Police Department, and then you drive off as they're screaming at you, that part is fun. Those, those turns are great, but most of the time it's just you're in your car or you're on foot and you figure, okay, well, where I need to be is six paces away, one, two, three, uh, maybe if I go this way, one, two, three, oh, no, that doesn't work. It's like all the things about line of sight and counting range that I don't like in skirmish games anymore. I don't like counting squares. I, I'm done with counting squares. I don't like it. And Brook City, a lot of that is doing that. So when you're keen, cool abilities to get where you need to go, that's fine. But when you're just staring at a map and realizing, oh, it's just too far away, I guess I can't do what I want to do this turn. And that's part of the game. That's legit. I will grant you that the fact that the criminals don't move is an advantage. But by the same token, uh, we've actually ended up in some contexts where it's led to considerable confusion as to which criminal is which. And you're looking at a map. And is this 012? No, I don't have 012. I've got J18. Okay, fine. And you're comparing stats. So suffice to say that the core system... We still really like it's again. It's it's all Sentinels of the Multiverse. It's you know three different decks working in conjunction. Literally, the only thing I like about the bad guys is they don't move. And yeah, everything you just said, I agree with. Like knowing which one was which, and the fact that they have different abilities. Whereas in Street Masters, there's different enemies, and they all have really unique, interesting abilities, and they all marked that part is cool. But like I said, then you have to you know remember what each one does. But anyway, I digress. Yeah, it, they they each have strengths and weaknesses, and. 
in an incredibly simple case, like we were, I think we were honestly playing the simplest combination of criminal and case, or at least one of the simplest combinations. I've seen some really, really weird ones. And it's also worth noting, I played a different game, not with you, of Brook City this week. And I actually felt for the first time in any of these systems, whether it's uh, in Sentinels or Street Masters or Brook City, where a combination of cards kind of broke the game, more or less. There was this one case we were playing where the goal of the case is to get to the last card. And there are ways to mill the deck. If you're doing really well, you can mill the deck and you can get to the bottom of the case card. Well, one cop has this card that says, well, look at the top X cards of the case deck, rearrange them as you see fit. And we were about two-thirds of the way through the case, and the player that, that I was playing with looked at the cards and said, um... I think this just means we win. And he plays the card and we look at it and we all scratch our heads and we all say the same thing. This probably shouldn't work this way, but I think this is how it works. It's like, okay. And so he rearranges the deck and he puts the win card at the top of the deck. And that's it. We won. So that wasn't cool. Again, as I commented last week, I think that the variety that they've purchased with respect to these different cases is not worth the cost that we pay in terms of overhead and in terms of even just sometimes thematic disconnect. Like, I had a difficult time explaining why the criminal was doing what the case had the the, the criminal representing. Whereas, again, in a fighting game, it doesn't matter that nothing makes sense. And (laughs) it's like, okay, we're fighting on the top of a moving train. Okay, why not? Yeah, it's old school, you know, mobsters, cops, and you're just in there to punch people out, so it all makes sense. Exactly. We've all played Bad Dudes, I hope. Bad Dudes versus Dragon Ninja, you know? At some point, you're fighting on top of a semi, and uh, then a ninja with claws shows up at the end of it. Why not? That's That's just what happens, right? Anyhow... Uh, so more to, more to follow possibly on Brook City because despite, despite the fact that every time I play Brook City, I just want to play Street Masters more, I do see – I do want to see a couple more combinations. I do want to see it go through its system because, again, the core system is just very engaging and we're big fans of what the Saddlers put out. So over the coming week, I want to, number one, play Street Masters again and, number two, try Brook City in different combinations and at low player counts where we can keep things moving. So that's Brook City. Got to play a game called Ray Guns and Rocket Ships. When I introduced Ray Guns and Rocket Ships to the group, this was the first time I was playing it. I said, look, I can probably guarantee you that this is going to be pretty dumb, but it might be reasonably cute. And I have to say that I was definitely right on the pretty dumb. But Ray Guns and Rocket Ships is a sort of thematically, it's a, again, a throwback to the sort of 1950s era sci-fi rocket men sort of weird, weird aliens and, and space princesses and stuff like that. But in terms of gameplay, it is a sort of free-for-all whack fest. And I've been commenting that I'm looking for a free-for-all whack fest that works reasonably good. And it has elements of, and I want to use this very sparingly, that are within striking distance of games like Faster Than Light or Battle Stations. Battle Stations is a, is a sort of tabletop hybrid board game slash RPG thing where you need a a game master. But the salient issue that that appealed to me is where your crew is matters. You need to man guns, you need to man the helm and man all sorts of other things. And if you don't have staff, I should say, if you don't have staff on the guns, then the guns don't work as well. But you only have enough staff to go around and they start dying and you need to move them around. That part really appealed to me and you have boarding actions. I honestly think after a first play, It is not a great game, but it could be the best game of its type that I've tried. It didn't have degenerate player uh, turn order issues because turn order changes each uh, turn and the turns are very quick. So you don't really have to worry about being to the left of this person or the right of that person because it goes around so quickly. The boarding actions are straightforward and kind of cool. You show up, you murder a couple of enemy guys, and then you're... Then your uh, crew member is either ejected through the airlock or shot in the face or both. And there was a little bit of a problem whereby if you gang up on the same player, they're not really going to be able to recover. But not to the same extent that a lot of other games of this ilk. So, look, we've tried Wildlands. We've tried GKR. We've tried uh, uh, tons of games of this ilk. And they've all really fallen apart on fundamental mechanical levels. And my first play of Ray Guns and Rocket Ships did not display any of those classic degeneracies. And so suffice to say that while I'm not super enthusiastic about it as a game overall... I'm super enthusiastic about where it sits in the overall genre because I've been looking for a game like this that works. And so far, it works. I know that sounds like damning with faint praise, but I'd like to try it again. I'd like to try uh, maybe different player counts. We played with three. Some of the scenarios look super dodgy. That might be pushing things past where they want to go. But as a as a free-for-all, just shoot people and collect points, it worked surprisingly well. And I enjoyed my time with Ray Guns and Rocket Ships. I'm looking forward to trying it. It sounds fantastic. It's not fantastic. But it, sounds, it works. Yes. And it's diverting. And the cover looks, like you said, you know, throwback to the 50s. You know, yes. The old bubble heads with giant 
circular ray gun. Yeah, that looks like and this. in a way, so th- that's a that's a visual genre that's been done before in other games, even really good games like Space Cadets Away Missions, which I, I maintain is a solid, solid, solid game and a and a very worthy entrant in a crowded field of very good games, and the sort of co op, not quite dungeon crawly, but like tactical combat kind of adventure stuff. But the visual tone of Space Cadets Away Missions is mostly too drab to really, I think, sell the genre. I don't get Flash Gordon or things of that ilk from that presentation. It's a little too muted, a little too gray, a little bit too somber in terms of the color palette. Ray Guns and Rocket Ships is just hardcore into the day glow kind of. You could put Queen Flash Gordon in the background, in, in the background which I know is not era appropriate, but to my mind is the definitive uh, uh, soundtrack to such things. Not that I believe in thematically appropriate soundtracks. Anyway, I'm interested in showing Ray Guns and Rocket Ships to you. I hope you enjoy it. Finally, I got to try Game of Thrones Catan, Brotherhood of the Watch. Now, I realize that uh, Walker is now giving me a very judging look here. I am here. very interested in this game. <laughs> I don't think you are. Uh, no, I'm being serious. Oh, you are? Okay. Yeah. Here's the thing. I don't like core Catan. I don't enjoy it. It, it does. It, it's fine. It works mostly when it works, as opposed to just rolling around saying, anyone got any wheat? No wheat? No in the system? Blah, 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 blah. Repeat ad nauseum. But the Catan variants, some of the historical modules, some of the other variants, I have thoroughly enjoyed. I really like Starfarers of Catan. I think the two-player Catan uh, card game is excellent. And some of the other historical modules have been really, really neat. So I like what happens when you play a little bit with the system. And I'd heard very good things about Game of Thrones Catan, with two exceptions. Number one, the first edition... The first printing had some serious misprints, quite frankly unforgivable, probably more on this later, and it's grotesquely expensive. It's really, really, really expensive. And I will fault them especially for this, and this is this is completely not cool, and it strikes me as, as incredibly mercenary. Now, normally between the two of us, I'm, I'm always the first to say, well, look, you know, maybe there was this reason why they did this thing. Uh, <clears throat> so it's a game, I'm not super... Uh, I'm, I'm not super into the theme. I, I like Game of Thrones, the books, but not so much the, the, the TV show. Uh, but even people who don't know anything about Game of Thrones know who Jon Snow is. Jon Snow is not in the base game. Jon Snow is in the expansion. That's not cool. <laughs> well, well for, as for the price, I'm just thinking that who puts out Catan, it's... Uh... The, well, this was by Fantasy Flight. And they do have the license already, so it's not. I thought that maybe it was licensing fees that they said they had to, you know, sp- I don't know. a the ton piece, of money, so they had to. But the no, pieces are nice. It, the yeah. pieces are nice. It comes with a whole bunch of wildling figures, and they're great. And they have little wildling figures, and then they have much bigger giant figures, and those are cool. You actually get a wall made out of relatively pa- tall plastic, which serves to obscure the relevant numbers for half the people playing at the table. Look, it's a, it's a very nice presentation overall, but uh, I do think that it's a little not cool that in the base game you can play as, you know, Samuel Tarly or Jor Mormor or all those other things who are important characters. But if you want to play as Jon Snow, you need the expansion. That's, that's not cool. But anyhow, setting all that aside, I was very disappointed in the game as a game, and here's why. Game of Thrones as, as a theme, specifically at the wall, is kind of a good match. But the Catani bits, I think they messed up. And the reason is the Catan system works when there's the proper influx of resources in the system. You got too few resources in the system, the game stagnates. You got too many resources or too much flexibility in terms of the resources, and nobody needs to trade. And Game of Thrones and, and Catan without trading is not really much of a game. In the Game of Thrones Catan version, there are lots and lots and lots of ways to make resources wild, to do one-to-one trades with the bank, to force trades with other players, to substitute resources for other resources in the context of buying this, that, or the other thing. And there's one more thing to buy as opposed to normal Catan, and so there's more flexibility in the system that way too because there's another recipe you can seek to fulfill. There was so little trading in this game. It was mostly just head down. It's like, okay, I'm buying this. Now I'm buying this. Now I'm buying this other thing. Okay, your turn now. Uh, we never really had to worry about it. It's like, you don't have a wheat? Fine. Go get the character that says you don't need to worry about what resource you have when you're buying a guard. Go buy that guard. And that was really disappointing. Furthermore, the other bit, the bit that actually made me really enthusiastic about the game was the pressure from the wildlings. There's actually an alternate end condition whereby if the wall gets breached too many times or if the wildlings occupy too many spaces, the game ends and you don't win by victory points. You win by whoever is best staffed the wall, which I would regard as the not my fault defense. The I did my job defense. That's right. It's like, yeah, I realized civilization fell and everybody got conquered, but uh, I did mine. So yeah, I helped kill the troll. So everything's fine. Exactly. It, it's, it's those guys fault. But we never felt any serious pressure from the wildlings. They didn't advance fast enough. They didn't populate the board quickly enough. And I had to check the rules a couple times to make absolutely sure that I wasn't missing something. But we were playing correctly. 
And they just never threatened us. And even if they had passed the wall, again, there are all these special abilities that serve to remove them from the map. And that part is kind of necessary because, long story short, if a wildling breaches the wall or, or crosses the wall, it shows up and it occupies the space much like the robber does. And that, uh, that space will never produce again. Well, if you've got a couple settlements or a, a, a keep or two on that space and it just gets nuked in the middle of the game, well, that's not a good player experience. So, yeah, you have to have some flexibility in removing them. But, again... We always had this notion that no, no matter – in addition to the fact that they weren't apt to breach the wall, even if they did, we would be able to fix it in half a dozen ways. So I had I had high hopes. Uh, it, w- it wasn't an unpleasant experience. It was just kind of boring. It was just a little tedious. You know, it's fun to buy things in the f- fundamental Catan formula. But there wasn't tension in the resources, so we never really had to trade much. And there wasn't tension for the wildlings, so the alternate win conditions, although theoretically interesting, never really manifested. So – I was very disappointed overall with the Game of Thrones Catan, and I uh, furthermore blame it for uh, sapping my credibility amongst Huey and Louie because I was like, no, 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 trust me. Sometimes the the, the game the Catan variants are good, and they're like, okay, fine. And now I just don't have any credibility anymore. Oh, way to go. It's their fault. Anyway. Uh, if only you had some sort of media influence that you know brought your credibility back up. Nobody takes anything I say seriously. Oh, I was trying to... That's what my dad says. I try to bring that softly to you, but that's true. Yeah, that's that's reasonable. I I I appreciate that this is the sort of intervention that I need, but there you go. It still stings. <laughs> now on to the news and why it really doesn't matter. Breaking news. This is over over and above the news I already had. I just thought of it. I just got notification of a expansion, Kickstarter expansion that I ordered to a game that I've already gotten rid of. <laughs> Hell, surprise, here it happens again. <laughs> That's the way of things, right? Exactly. It's like, oh, yeah, I remember I got that expansion, and now I won't be able to. I'm sure I'll find someone else that has the game, and either A, I'll get to try it and just let them keep it, or somehow I'll get a chance to give it away. For my own edification, what game would this be? It was the Everdale expansion. Oh, I see. It's called Pearl something or other. Sure. That's a compelling title right there. Yeah, I know. I was... It was one of these things where I, you know, the Kickstarter, you know, mysteriously came out before the game, you know, hit to buyers. So, you know, they, everyone would buy it up before they knew whatever. Not saying Everdale was a terrible it, game. It's but, the new release cycle. But I, I do not think I would get an expansion for it. If, you got to strike while the iron is ex- hot. And the exactly. iron is hottest before people get to actually play it. So, all right. So people have been asking with an increased fever lately about why the news doesn't matter. Most of the time it's implied. But here I actually have a reason why I would like to explain why our news – our news in particular doesn't matter. And here, allow me to make a relatively blunt statement. And I, my apologies sincerely if this causes offense, but allow me to explain. There's no such thing as board games journalism. It just doesn't exist. The kind of investigative reporting that we take for granted, even in the context of entertainment, just does not exist in board gaming. Instead, what we have are critics like ourselves, and then there are people who just amplify press releases. Again, which is sometimes things that we do, and that's one of the things why why we don't think it matters. You know, we're just expressing our own enthusiasm, but we don't necessarily want to become part of the hype machine necessarily. But there's nobody who's involved in genuine objective reporting to chase down leads, to cultivate sources, to be able to comment with authority and with some degree of insight about some of the stuff that goes on behind the scenes. And so all we're left with in most of these stories, even the ones that matter, is a series of he said, he said. Unfortunately, mostly because it's, it's, you know, our industry is still male-dominated. So, tariffs. Ooh, I'm excited already. Well, no, it's relevant, right? (laughs) Because we know that there's going to be an increasing escalation in terms of the reciprocal tariffs between the United States and China. Although, done uh, unilaterally, it's still going to end up being reciprocal. Here's the thing. I've heard from people on various corners of the internet that, er that claim everything from... This will not affect board games at all to it might affect board games, but we're not going to pay too much of an increased premium to everything we buy is going to be a quarter or more expensive starting in about a month. And I've heard this from people inside the industry. I've heard this from people outside the industry. I've heard this from people who say they work in customs and who work as brokers. I've heard this from people who are just general economists. Seriously, run the gamut. And I don't know what to make of any of this. Well, I, I just know from business experience if any, and from from things that have happened, bigger companies like Admos Day or Games Workshop, they, they, they have some sort of business sense. So they see this coming and they just automatically raise prices on everything just to cover what might happen. This is how legitimate businesses work. Sure. 
And I, but I don't know how pervasive that's going to be, and I don't know whether it's going to be the, the, the quarter hit or not. For example, I've imported lots of things uh, from China over the years, and I've had to pay customs for them. But you pay customs on the declared value, and sometimes the declared value is you know a tenth of what it actually costs. I don't know what the procedures are for such things. And so I've had people – again, I've seen people comment on Reddit and other places that work in customs and say, look, the declared value is always like less than a tenth of the actual sticker price. And I've seen people say the opposite. And I wish – I wish that I had somebody I could trust that, w- that would be able to comment on these things. I do know that I've had a couple of very scared emails from publishers saying – with ongoing Kickstarters because in the worst case scenario where everything is going to go up by 25 percent, publishers who have already raised money on a Kickstarter but have not yet fulfilled, they're really boned because they're going to have to pay up front out of their own pockets this 25 percent and then maybe they'll be able to make it up on the back end from backers. Maybe not. Who knows? It's kind of the Wild West as far as these these things are concerned. So a number of people who have ongoing Kickstarters for which I pled have sent, have sent very borderline panicked emails to me saying, look, we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, you might have to give us more money, which is legitimate. I don't know. And so – Suffice to say that tariffs are a thing. Tariffs are increasing between the United States and China, and most board games are made in China, and you can't pivot on a dime to uh, have them manufactured elsewhere, and there's not surplus capacity elsewhere. If, even if everyone in the world decided that they want their board games printed in Germany or elsewhere in Europe or whatnot, it's not like there are a whole bunch of publishers with empty printing presses just waiting for thousands of board game projects to shift production. So this could be a thing. And and the problem is, that's all I can say. It could be a thing because, again, there's no investigative journalism that could be able to say, look, I talked to this lawyer. I talked to these other people. I called these broker agents who work in China. I have these sources that I trust. Here's the situation. But I suspect you're right and that regardless of the legitimacy of any of those uh, fears, we're going to end up paying more in the short term. So that's all I have to say about tariffs. <laughs> Minor ex post facto editorial insertion here. Just to emphasize the wrong in our title, mere moments after recording this and issuing wild generalizations about the absence of journalism, I was actually pointed to a most excellent article on Polygon where a journalist named Charlie Hall actually engaged in board game journalism. So I was completely wrong as per usual, and you should really check out this article on Polygon about tariffs and board games. The link is in the episode description. And my sincere apologies to all board game journalists. Also, more Kickstarter news. Space Invaders, the game is on Kickstarter, and who's excited? Everybody. That being said, they did a great job of making it look very authentic. It looks very interesting. It's a card system that as you kill the aliens, you flip over the cards, and you're getting more abilities, and you're trying to find clues. I haven't looked closely into it, but I I wanted to see if they legitimately tried to make an actual game as opposed to just a quick money grab, and it does look like they've made a genuine effort to make an interesting game. So I'm looking to see, you know, where that comes. Because, you know, they announced there was a Missile Command game and a... Centipede, I think. Centipede and all sorts of these, you know, old box games. So we'll see how this goes. So that's Space Invaders, the board game on Kickstarter. Also under the aegis of I Wish I Knew Who to Trust... There's been a tussle over Stonemaier Games' new publishing arrangement, whereby they unilaterally announced they were no longer going to sell to distributors or retailers that lied about them, namely Stonemaier Games. Because the claim is, on the part of Jamie Stegmaier and the people at Stonemaier, that a number of people have falsely blamed them for not being able to fulfill Wingspan pre-orders. And so they said that, that anybody that blamed Stonemeyer unfairly was now not going to be sold to. Enter the gaming goat, which is... Like, was the letter like written like so? Uh, screw you guys. I'm, I'm going, going home. home. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm taking my toys and I'm going home. Gotcha. So enter the gaming goat, which is a franchise operation of a couple of dozen gaming stores... And the guy who runs the company showed up on Reddit and said, here are screen grabs of all the communications I've had with Stonemeyer over the course of things. I've now been blacklisted, even though the story that I told my customers is exactly the story that actually happened. Namely, I pre-ordered 3,000 copies of Wingspan and I got four. And so when I told people that, look, it wasn't my fault, I was telling the truth, and now I can't sell Stonemeyer Games products anymore. Jamie has said that this person's a loon. And so, again, what we have here is this, I wish I knew what to make of this crazy situation because it's really weird, all told. Now, of course, Stonemeyer is a private corporation can sell to whatever they want for whatever reason, well, with the exception of, of civil rights violations. And I don't think anyone's claiming that this is some sort of civil rights violation. But it's a strange situation, to say the least. There have been lots of Reddit threads. There's a, a, a long-running uh, board game thread. But the problem is, again, as, a, as somebody who wants 
access to good information. All that we have are a whole bunch of people showing up on board game and saying, well, I trust Jamie because he was really good about sending me a replacement board and I like the games he designs versus, well, I trust this other guy because he provided screen caps of emails, which may or may not be authentic. Uh, versus I trust this other guy because Jamie was a jerk to me once at a con. Like, this is not legitimate basis for information, but this is all we have, and I find it very, very frustrating because it's an interesting situation, and I wish I knew what to make of it rather than just my own gut uh, intuitions. And this is why I wish we had a little bit more journalism going on. Anyhow, so that's my that's my second <laughs> explanation about why the news doesn't matter because we don't know what to make of all this stuff. My rant about why it doesn't matter is the fact that people have so many varying opinions. So just because we find something interesting in the news, maybe other people won't. And that's why I say it really doesn't matter. Sure. Because I think Space Invaders is is somewhat interesting. Everybody else might think it's a pile of garbage. So that's why it doesn't matter. The final bit of news, though, and this probably matters a great deal to Walker, is that Colossal Games, who had a whole bunch of Kickstarter projects yanked from Kickstarter under the ostensible justification that they were violating some nebulous standards that Kickstarter has failed to clearly articulate or enforce consistently, has announced that they're going to be relaunching, uh, I don't know how to say this in English, Papillon? How would you say it? Papillon? Butterfly game. It's the butterfly game. It's the butterfly game. So uh, Papillon, they say, is going to be back on Kickstarter on May 30th. Nice. And they say that they've, they issued, uh, uh, they sent an email to a whole bunch of their Kickstarter backers that was very vague. And it said, we've been in communication with Kickstarter about how to comply with blah, 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 blah. It was one of those things that didn't really say anything. Uh, So who knows? Maybe it'll be up on the 30th and down on the 31st. (laughs) So (laughs) you can look forward to that. Butterflies. And that is the news and why butterflies don't matter. Butterflies do matter, but the news doesn't. Oh, sorry. My mistake. Sure. On to our feature game, which is Gentis. I suppose for the sake of clarification, we should say that we're talking about the Deluxified Edition. Put up a tasty, tasty minstrel this year. This was designed by St- uh, Stefan Risthaus. He d- has designed a, a bunch of uh, Euro efficiency management games. His most famous one other than Gentis is probably Arkwright, which was released in 2014. Both Gentis and Arkwright were released under initially under the German imprint Spielworks with two X's. Not to imply sexiness, I think, just to imply, you know, workiness. And it was reprinted by Tasty Minstrel under their, you know, their, their tendency to reprint things with upgraded components. Sometimes they do this with original designs that they're publishing for the first time, like Crusaders that we've already talked about, or Downfall, which we've tried once and we'll probably try some more. And also they do this with reprints, like most famously, I think, with Orléans and Yokohama, and now with Gentis. So Coliseum. Wa- and Coliseum, exactly. Uh, although, so Walker, why don't you give us an unhelpful summary of what one does in Gentis? So in Gentis, it's sort of like a worker placement action selection game where you're trying to get victory points by playing cards and creating a better engine to play more cards by playing more cards. Did I mention that you play a lot of cards in this game? Well, you play cards and that's how you win. This being said, there's many different ways to play. You can uh, put out buildings for extra actions and income and action modifiers, or you can collect these cubes to receive special bonuses, or you can train your population, get more flexibility for playing more cards, which gets you victory conditions. And don't forget to unlock your extra actions. So there's lots of things to do in Gentis. What do you think, Mark? So I think you hit the nail right on the head when you called it a worker placement game because although I definitely think that there are lots of games that are not worker placement that called get called worker placement, Gentis is the other way around. It's a game that is a worker placement game that tries to hide that it's a worker placement game. You select these tiles from the central game board and they go on to this track of yours that has a limited number of spaces. And every tile that you take costs a certain amount of quote-unquote time. But really what this amounts to is inst- a very easy way to parse this is instead of taking a tile, which then gives you two time, is to say this is an action that costs you three workers. And the number of workers you have is the number of spaces you have on your board. And the moment I re-internalize that, and I'm saying this not just for, for the, the, the point of taxonomical pedantry, gen- it is genuinely the case that when I played it for the first time and after about you know the first couple actions, I was like, oh, wait, no, this is just worker placement. That actually made the game make more sense to me. And it actually allowed me to play a little bit more intelligently. There is one clever bit about the worker placement, and that is the element of how you manage the so-called time. Because normally in a game like Feast for Odin, which also has various spaces which have variable amounts of worker – it costs variable amounts of workers to place there, you just put out the workers and that's that. In Gentis, at least, you have a little bit of flexibility, a little bit of nuance, and this part is kind of cool, whereby if something costs two or more time, you can either have – 
it costs that many workers, or you can bunch them up and save workers this time, but it will contract your available actions next round. So in other words, you can either spend two actions this round or spend one action this round, and it'll cost you an extra action next round. That part is kind of neat. So we've been throwing this term around a lot lately, and that's decision space. And there is decision space in this game. There are options. There are looking. It's looking down the board and figuring out and it's a great part, it's a part of board gaming which I enjoy. Which actions must you take right away and which ones can you wait till later? What do you have to take before the other players take them? And what cards you need to get before the other players get them? And there's a cool synergy between the cards. Not only do they improve your engine, but there's symbols on the cards that when you play them, they're all going to work together and give you more action, more victory points. So there's definitely a decision space in this game. And I thought that was a great part. I'll also note on a related issue that unlike a lot of other worker placement games, even the ones we really like, there seems to be a lot more competition for the spaces in Gentis than there are in lots of other ones. Now, there's not a whole lot of competition for the actual cards. Sometimes the card you want gets bought by somebody else, but then you look and say, okay, well, I'll buy this other card anyway. But the action spaces, because everything, as you astutely observed, funnels down to mostly about playing cards... And the throughput of playing cards is first you buy the card, and then you get the prerequisites for playing the card, and then you play the card. And all of these are different actions. And so those actions, if you're on the wrong cycle of this and your opponents are grabbing all the play cards actions before you can get there, it's really painful. And so that element of competition I find more palpable in Gentis than a lot of other worker placement games, even worker placement games I prefer. Yeah, not only are the tiles disappearing before you can get them, but your action at the top is filling up and you're running out of spaces to do those actions. And I thought it was a very interesting, you know, puzzle to figure out. It is. The strange thing, though, and I am going to fault uh, the, the, the game design for this a little bit, is that it feels more complicated than it really is. Fundamentally, Gentis is a very simple game, but every time I sit down to explain it, it takes me roughly twice as long as I think it ought to. Now, maybe this is just my fault, but fundamentally, it is just about buying the cards, getting the prerequisites, and then playing the cards. There's some other stuff going on. There's some city stuff, which is kind of ancillary. But given how focused all those actions are, and given how straightforward it all comes down to, it's the number of details involved and the way that the the costs are represented, it's just a little bit more grit than I would necessarily appreciate for a game that fundamentally is extremely straightforward. I have yet to see a serious challenge to the generalization that if you play more cards, certainly more cards of Era 3, you're going to win by a substantial margin. And all the other stuff, all the other bits about building an engine and getting other synergies and stuff like that, although potentially cool, all serve the purpose of playing out these 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 Civ cards. Yeah, definitely. Like you said, there's two spots on the board that no matter who we played it with, they had trouble with it. And that's training your population and buying cards. It's one of these things where you had to pay for the tile, and then depending on what you paid for the tile, it allowed you like this weird sliding scale of what you could do, either, you know, do something twice or get two cards or, but you didn't actually pay that much, you paid a little bit less, or if you want to do more, you had to pay a little bit more, and then there's modifiers to that, so exactly like you said, for a game that flows so well and is fairly basic, they made it, those two spaces way more fiddly than they needed to be. Another thing that Gentis does, which honestly feels like a little bit of a throwback, and which I had encountered a long time, is it is a worker placement game where you can get more workers. Honestly, this isn't, this isn't something that I'd encountered in a while. I thought this was a thing that we, as, as a, a general gamer community, decided was a bad idea. You know, since the early days of Agricola and of the days of Stone Age and the so-called Nookie Hut. You know, if you can get more workers, you really should. And that, again, is one of those things that Gentis does. There, your, your track, which determines how many actions you can take, there are ways, there are some buildings that you can buy, some cards, rather, that allow you to clear locks off of that track. And when I, when I played the game for the very first time and somebody played a building and then removed a lock from the track, I'm like, wait a minute, that, that's got to be super awesome. And sure enough, it is. I'm not going to claim that it's unbalanced per se because there are a lot of other factors that go into a card. I was just surprised to see that element reintroduced into fundamentally a worker placement game. If you can get more actions, you should. And so that was a weird blast from the past. And what usually happens, and you've noticed this and I noticed this because we play games with so many different groups, is that when we introduce this to a new group, they focus on a totally different part of the board and make the game a completely different thing. So you uh, explained a game the other night to a group and then and left, but you saw it already happen. Yes. They were already concentrating on this one part of the board, and let me tell you, that continued, and, and it was fairly... It changed the game, and it was it's very... 
I love games like that where when you introduce it to different people, they play it a totally different way. And it's one of the things that I really love about this hobby is that, you know, regardless of the game, you know, it can be played in totally different atmosphere with different players and, and you get a totally unique experience every time. How one approaches the emphasis on city building, because that's specifically what we're talking exactly. about. Cities don't really get you points in and of themselves. In some contexts, they kind of do, but nothing compared to the overwhelming emphasis on buying and playing cards. And this emphasis is matched in terms of rule systems as well. It's not like it's you know hidden and, and a secret. It's relatively straightforward that cards are what you need to do. But... It is easy sometimes to underestimate the income benefits and or the synergy bonuses that you can get from building building buildings in a certain way. And I will grant you that that is one of the areas where I think that Gentis does allow you to play, play around a little bit and exercise different strategies. It's a shame that it's not more of the game because this is, a, this is another issue. The theming of Gentis, which we haven't really talked about, is sort of uh, antiquity civilization. You know, not not the kind of Civ game where you're in the Sid Meier mold of where eventually you're going to have Napoleon leading a tank battalion, whatever. Now, this is more like in this in the thematic wheelhouse, though not mechanically, of a more Tresham civilization game where, you know, the game is going to end way before what we would identify as anything remotely re- re- approaching modernity. But... Uh, thematically, it's, you know, you don't really feel the theme at all. You know, I'm building a city in Rhodes. Okay, well, now I'm building a city clear across the other side of the Mediterranean. I'm building a catapult, and this catapult gives me a merchant for some reason. And now I'm building a theater, and this theater costs scholars for reasons passing understanding. And so it, it's it's almost entirely themeless. And I wish that the city building in particular had a little bit more... Uh, you could spend a little bit more time focusing on it. There was a little bit more of a ramp up. I, I realize this would probably blow up the playing time, but what have you. And really give you a sense of geography. Because when I'm playing other Civ games, whether it's uh, detailed stuff like Tresham Civilization or whether it's something like Antica or anything of that nature, you know, the spatial element matters. Where your cities are is relevant and you get a sense of geography in place. Here, because it's so themeless and because it can be so ancillary to the game, you're just plopping down these buildings in random locations. agree. The little theme that you do get is in the production. It is so fantastic. It is a joy to look at. They've got it done in this, you know, caveman art motif where it's all these like very intricate, you know, drawings of, of people and it really pops on the board. Even your player mats, you know, it has these little wooden, you know, meeples that all match the giant ones that go on the board. I think it looks fantastic. And the little theme that you do get comes out in the production of this game. So let's talk a little bit about the production, because I agree with you entirely that visually it's very arresting. Uh, I, I disagree with the, the player boards themselves. I think they look kind of washed out and a little bit drab. But the art style, more than just well executed and consistently executed, is it doesn't look like every other board game on the market, which is very nice. And particularly in the case of these silk screened, very large custom shaped meeples that represent the various kinds of workers that you need to recruit. Uh, workers in the sense of population, not in the sense of actual actions, which are abstracted away. So there are six different population types you need to hire. Soldiers, priests, uh, merchants. We, of course, have, uh, in the classic Walker vein, recast them as... Uh, what are what are soldiers well, again? Uh, I, can't... I don't think we did soldiers, but we did okay. old man with the walker, and we did fashion, fashion models. Fashion models, and bunny priests. Bunny priests, yeah, all yeah, sorts yeah. of And they're absolutely beautiful. They are in a very striking original style, and they're really, really, really great. All of that having been said, <clears throat> this, 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 this might get into rant territory, so you're going to have to pull me back here. I'm sick and tired of second editions of games, because that's what this is. There was a Spielworks edition that had no typos. This edition has typos. There were misprinted cards, what they've replaced, which is great, but the board is misprinted, which is crazy. The same thing happened with Spirit Island. The first edition had one typo that was so minor that I've never even noticed. They replaced uh, desert for sands. It's like, okay, fine, no problem. Whereas the second edition, second printing and subsequent printings of of Spirit Island have that weird rotating series of typos in rule books and cards. Similarly here, they introduced typos on the board itself. Where, and now they like, oh, it's a variant now. It's like, no, it's not a variant. It's a mistake you made that you're decided to live with. That's fine. <laughs> and some of the components are uh, pretty at the expense of usability. You mentioned one in particular with respect to the large instances of the meeples that I think is is, is worth sharing. Well, yeah, I thought, I thought Rising Sun had those fantastic uh, action tiles at the top. And I just think that they would have looked much better because it's sort of like the caveman looking motif if they made them like sort of like stone tablets and tiles they would have slid along a lot better and then it just would have worked better and looked 
a lot better. Yeah, there's a, there's a row of six uh, figures that need to be arranged in, in order. And if they had been some sort of chunky, satisfying tile material, they would have spaced themselves out much, much better instead of these custom shapes, which, although very visually attractive, are less usable than they would have been uh, for equally attractive, perhaps, and more usable other tiles. So the hourglasses... Uh, barely fit on the player mat as as designed. Uh, it actually is the case, though, and it, additionally that, again, they're screen-printed tokens, which is great, but because of the component decision they made, there are some usability issues. One player we played with in one of the games we had was consistently misinterpreting a rule, and that rule's interpretation would have been impossible under the components introduced in the first edition. Uh, and... You know, all of this, all of these are very, very, very minor. But yeah, the again, other, the other minor one is the buildings. Let's just throw it out the same. Sure, thing. the deluxified. Everyone has their own unique buildings, but they're not usable because you can do these extra actions by putting out uh, cubes on top of the buildings, and half, more than half, three quarters of the buildings you can't put cubes on because of the shape that they chose to make the building. So it's impossible to. You have to like put them on their side or or beside the building and. It, minor, like you said, the but on, still. The only reason why any of this bears mentioning, to be honest, although we do we do mention usability on many games, is that this is a second edition. They had a perfectly functional first edition, and they introduced usability problems in the second. And this is one of the reasons why I'm dubious of a lot of these deluxe versions of a lot of games, because sometimes they just get the aesthetics, let the aesthetics get them carried away with. And... As you mentioned before, this is something we mentioned when we talked about Crusaders. One of the great things about Crusaders was that Tasty Minstrel gave you both the deluxe versions and the normal versions, and you could pick, and they were both very pretty. Here, you don't have the base versions available. You don't have tokens to sub for the hourglasses if you if you don't want them to fit. You don't have different buildings that might be smaller, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so you just don't have the options. In Downfall, we complained again about the, the, the deluxe components being less usable, but there at least you have the base components available, so you can swap them in and it'll take the less, less space. I wish they'd included the base tokens, because I, I would honestly swap out some of the, 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 the base components just to make it a little bit easier. And I just... I, I'm having difficulty. I'm probably going to talk about this more in an editorial on um, on the, the Patreon feed. I am sincerely trying to remember whether back in the days of Avalon Hill they were actually better or whether this is just nostalgia talking. Because I don't remember problems like this creeping in on the reg. Like, I remember in Avalon Hill there was a misprint on one copy of a card, uh, on one card in up front, but the rest was fine. And they produced these massive games that were error-free. True, but it was like one every three years, whereas these... That's are- not true. <laughs> but anyway, that, that, that's a separate aside. I really shouldn't be complaining that much, but again, it just bothers me when you introduce errors into a functional product. Rant over. All right. Let's go over these good points that we didn't hit so far. I love the victory conditions. There's three victory victory conditions to strive for, so it sort of gets, you know points you in a direction of the game. It's have you know eight cards played out, get all of your buildings out on the board, or max out your population. Yeah, but they're these, not they're, those aren't three different victory conditions. Those are three sources of bonus points, which again, which will be dwarfed by the number of points you're going to get from just playing. Lots true, of but cards. it sort of gives you a direction, right? If That's you're true. New to the game. I also have. It's one of these games that are easy to remember. Like once now that we've played it, we don't need to look at the rule book again. Even I think you know a year from now we pull it out, you know you just start playing, and we played it at all player counts, and I think it worked well at all. You know once we got over the fiddly rules that were misprinted and 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 so poorly worded that it was painful. Once we got over that part, then I think it it scaled very well at all player counts. Yes. Absolutely. And again, it's it's weird because of how simple and smooth the game is based on how difficult it is to teach. It's not, look, it's not a nightmare like Pax Renaissance or, or an hour-long game explanation, but it's just so strange to remember how simple the game is. And then once you're teaching, it's like, oh, and here's this thing and this other thing. and it, it's, it's really strange. But yeah, super easy to remember how the systems work. Super easy to remember how the iconography and all the buildings work because all the cards are different buildings and they give you different things. But I, after playing it, the first time, I only had to check the, the the reference work, the most excellent reference work for what it's worth, of the buildings once or twice of the second game and never since. All right. So then that's all the good points I have and two bad points that we haven't hit yet. One that even though we talked about the disappearing actions and the cards, I really think it's a, it's a seems like very much a solo game. Even if they take the actions, there's even a, there's going to be a more expensive one tree. You have to pay more actions and or more money, but usually you get to do what you want. It just costs more. And if they take a card you want, well, there's going to, they're going to slide down, and one that's almost as good is roughly the same price. So I feel as always a little bit heads down, and this sort of 
goes into my second point, which is sort of a generic thing, is why this game doesn't hit. It, it's so good. The production is great. The flow is good and what you're doing feels good, but why doesn't it hit like these other games? And I've sort of had this minor epiphany. It's like in Terraforming Mars, you're all working on this planet. It's something that you're doing together. In Great Western Trail, you're everyone's building the same map. You're all sort of contributing together to make this map and you're, you know, you're making your deck. Tio Tawakin, everyone's working together to build this temple. It's something that all the players doing in Scythe. You're, you have, you're building these actions out that trigger off of other abilities. It's like these things that unite the table and they, this game just doesn't have that. And I'm wondering if these game designers can pick up on this and sort of, you know, start knocking these games out that all sort of have that feeling. And I think they're going to do much better. I, I think you're right to point out that there are certain kinds of player interaction that are immediately satisfying. And while it is definitely the case that you're going to feel the the burn when people take actions that you're looking for, you're right that that just means you're going to have to pay more money. And that, again, is because there's a relative paucity of things to do in Gentis. More or less, you're building down cities, and building cities is mostly ancillary to playing cards. So mostly it's just a function of navigating the, the, the necessities of, of playing all these cards. So the player interaction is kind of there, but it's, it's and more so than lots of other worker placement games, but it doesn't really block you where there's no sense of real competition. The comparisons that I have are, are similar but, but somewhat different. When I think of games of a similar theme, I want something like Antica where there's more player interaction and where the, the, the game, I think, is more smooth and approachable, or even something like Innovation, which is a tableau builder, but it has the same sort of roughly, you know, basic civilization kind of feel-ish, certainly at the beginning, and you do get more direct competition and direct cooperation with other people. And when it comes to worker placement, look, we've said this a million times before, you're you're spoiled for choice when it comes to worker placement games. The two that we probably both agree on the most are probably things like Dogs of War or Feast for Odin. We both love those worker placement games. Then we each have our own preferences past that. Something that I was actually reminded of, and this is a strange comparison to make in terms of something uh, I, I prefer, is Kalamala. Because again, Kalamala comes to a very focused point in that you're putting down cubes for area majority. But area majority is inherently more competitive than just playing out cards that give you uh, victory points. And the systems are so much smoother. But in Kalamala, you also have these questions of tempo. Do I want to do this inefficient thing now or this more efficient thing later? And it also has an interesting action selection mechanism, which Gentis pretends to have but doesn't really. So you have those issues of tempo and trade-off that Gentis wants to do, but in a much more successful, more player interactive, more uh, indirect package. And it, it still has the benefit of being very simple and smooth. So I agree with you that Gentis has a lot going on for it. But at the end of the day, it doesn't hit. It doesn't really connect. And it ends up feeling relatively soulless and bland because, again, you're just playing out these cards. And initially, and this is definitely something I felt even by the end of the first game, Initially, the card variety strikes you as a tremendous asset of a game like Gentis because there are all these unique cards, but they pretty much all come out every game. As a result, by the end of the second playing, the second time I played Gentis, I felt like I'd mostly seen all of what the cards had to offer, and that really kind of took the, a lot of the wind out of the sails, and so I find I, I found Gentis relatively repetitive. Yes, smooth. Yes, absolutely approachable once you get past the rules hurdle, but it doesn't really land in a way that a, a lot of other games do, and that's unfortunate because, as you say, a lot of effort went into the production. So that being said, I think it's a great introductory game. Like you have people that, you know, are uh, sick of their current worker placement or even new players to the game. I think this is a great uh, way to introduce them to a worker placement type game. The thing with the hourglasses, I think is fantastic. I really enjoy that part where some actions, you know, take more time than the rest. It's sort of like a red November type thing where, you know, it's taking more time. I, I always enjoy that mechanism and just looks so, so it looks fantastic. I really love the look of this game. And even though I won't choose to play it, I, uh, if I'm introducing, it'll be definitely a game that I would introduce newer players to. For me, a game that I would use to usher people in from lighter stuff into slightly more medium Euro games should have the balance precisely reversed. Because as we've said, with Gentis, the rules burdens at the outset are far more substantial than need be, and it comes to the head in a relatively straightforward game. I would much rather it work the other way around, where the rules burden is negligible, but the decision space, as we say, is much wider. And the moments of intimidation, the moments of, oh my gosh, what do I do, don't work 
at the fundamental level of, okay, how do I buy cards again? But instead about, whoa, what cards should I buy and what should I play? And again, for, for me, a game like Antica is on the other way around. Like the rules are incredibly simple, but then about halfway, halfway through the, the, the early game, people are like, oh, wow, I've got all these options. How do I, what do I do now? That's the kind of overwhel- sense of overwhelmingness that I think is good. And I think Gentis is just on the wrong end of those. But I've look, I've enjoyed my time with Gantis. I just feel like I felt like I was done with it about halfway through my second play, which is not ideal. And to a certain extent, that's just because it's a very crowded field. But also to a certain extent, I think it's because at the end of the day, it, there's not a whole lot to it. And there's no hook. And there's no hook. So that was our feelings on Gantis. And that is going to close it out for this week on So Very Wrong About Games. Thank you very much for joining us. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can reach Walker via his email, justrolledadice at gmail.com. That's J-O-S-T-R-O-L-L-D-A-D-I-C-E at gmail.com. You can reach me, Mark Bigney, on Twitter at The Games You Like. For more public discussion, you can find the So Very Wrong About Games Facebook page, or you can check out our Board Game Geek Guild, which is guild number 3236, and you can find us on Patreon. We read everything you send us, and we'll get back to you if we can. Thanks again for tuning in, and we hope to see you again soon. Peace! You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bigney. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time, and always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong. <laughs> <laughs>